So now that we know the Sanyo works more or less, we're going to try to make it work as as well as as we can. Obviously, well, if you watched the previous episode uh, of the resurrection of the Sanyo, you'll have noticed, no doubt, the screen tube, so the CRT, in fact, is on the weak side. the The image it it gave is really faint. Okay, it's still watchable in a dark room or something like that, but really it's 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 not a very strong image. So that's unfortunate uh, and and we can't really fix that unless I would replace this picture tube with a new one or at least a better one. But I don't have this exact model of picture tube lying around. In fact, if we look at it, it's a Sanyo 140 TB4. So yeah, I don't know. It might be compatible with a Sony model of the CRT, but I'd have to look it up. And in any case, getting a, a similar or an identical tube will be well will be rather hard to achieve but I might try uh, I'll, I'll certainly look uh, be on the lookout for one but don't get your hopes too high I thought we certainly need to look into two things first so first of all we have the uh, power supply, okay, and the power supply is this part here on which I'm shining my laser, okay. So this part um, works, it works reasonably well, but uh, it's supposed to give out a voltage of around, oh, I'd say... 12 volts give or take half a volt this pin right here okay so this pin uh, which is the output of the power supply in fact uh, outputs all the power necessary for the rest of the circuitry so yeah we're going to see if we can fix that that uh, level that power output level of the power supply the next thing we need to fix is uh, the amplifier and uh, the amplifier is really built on top of the power supply okay so let's say roughly speaking half of the of the board is really uh, nothing else but the sound amplifier of the TV okay so now you remember there were uh, germanium transistors in it and uh, it appeared the, the germanium transistors had all blown up um, in fact the speaker itself which is a 60 ohm speaker uh, blew up itself although visually it looks fine um, if you measure its uh, its resistance, um, it's open. Let's see what we get when we measure the resistance. There you go. Okay, I'm making contact. Open. Totally open. So yeah, the speaker blew up as well. And uh, my guess is that at one stage or another, uh, a couple of the electrolytics in the power amplifier uh, shorted and uh, the output transistors shorted. And uh, because they shorted out, they shorted out the driver transistor, which in turn blew up. So let's say it was a sort of a nasty chain reaction 
that took place in the amplifier. In any case, uh, the germanium transistors all blew up. There were three in it. And I replaced them by, say, standard uh, general purpose silicon transistors. But of course, the setup, let's say, is built around germanium type transistors and not silicon. So it means that all the voltages are off and all that and the amplification is not uh, what it should be. It's in fact pretty weak. Also, I'm using a replacement speaker, as you can tell, but the replacement speaker is a 4 ohm, not a 60 ohm. Uh, 60 ohms for a speaker is not really, <coughs> I'd say, a standard value. So yeah, we'll fix the power supply and we'll fix the amplifier first. So. Um, you'll recall that the power supply at its output right here okay, wasn't outputting the right voltage. Right there you see that the voltage at this point here should be 11.5 volts. But it was too high. Now I started to measure this here this div uh, voltage divider bridge okay because that is what ultimately biases this transistor to conduct more or less and therefore uh, to make the power transistor conduct more or less now you'll notice that this transistor the driver transistor is an NPN which means basically that uh, to conduct its base needs to be positively biased okay now um, it turns out that uh, since this is the original transistor here okay uh, the transistor must have well probably aged a bit and therefore with the original resistance values you see here just couldn't be biased properly anymore so what I actually did since this transistor was driving the power transistor way too much okay so in other words this one the power transistor was letting through too much DC power um, I needed to be able to squeeze, as it were, the conduction of this transistor shut. And the only way I can do that is by reducing the conductivity of this transistor. Okay? And the only way I can do that is by biasing its base more negatively than positively. Okay? since this divider bridge here puts just enough positive bias for this one to conduct just at the right amount let's say to let enough DC power through through the power transistor now like I said this one has aged a bit and therefore with the original values you see here just couldn't be biased properly anymore now, I could have replaced the pot meter, but uh, I decided against it because I don't have a suitable replacement. So I did the next best thing and I replaced this one. I replaced this one, which is uh, technically a 1500 ohms, by a 750 ohms, so half this value. So now have a look at the voltage we get on P12. Almost exactly 12 volts and I'm inputting 15.2 volts. All right. So that is exactly what I wanted. Now 
the reason why I set it to 12 volts, okay, come on, focus. The reason why I set it to 12 volts and not uh, 11 and a half, like written here, okay, is because I disconnected the CRT. So I'm pretty sure once the CRT is connected up, uh, the, the voltage at P12 will drop well, rather closely to 11 and a half. So uh, let's connect up the CRT and see if I'm right. I connected up the CRT to the P12 and the voltage dropped a little bit, but not as much as I had thought it would. So we're going to set the voltage a little bit lower. Let me see if I can do just that. Okay, there's 11.4. Oh, it's very touchy. Let's see. 43. Come on. There you go. 11 and a half. <clears throat> just like the service manual prescribed. And if you look at the screen, well, okay, it's not super bright, but let's say it's it's bright enough to be functional. All right, so that's one thing fixed. So now let's see if we can fix uh, the the amplifier. All right, I unmounted all the transistors that I had mounted originally for the uh, resurrection episode and instead I mounted them on on the bottom of the PCB instead of on, on the other side on the top side uh, just to make them a little bit more reachable uh, if I need to change anything now it turned out I had to change a few things and let me show you the result. Okay, what you're seeing now is the base, the signal on the base of one of the output transistors. Now, remember, I had to replace the original uh, germanium transistors by silicon transistors and that of course changed the, uh, the whole characteristic of the output amplifier, sound amplifier of the Sanyo. Also I'm using an 8 ohm speaker now instead of a 60 ohm one. So yeah, it's quite a bit louder, but it's still not very loud. And I'm suspecting one of the reasons why, why you could argue it's still a bit wimpy, the sound, although uh, even for me with very bad ears I can hear it clearly, is because the uh, sound signal is uh, out of tune with the video signal. Let me show you. Okay, so this is how the video signal should look when the TV is properly tuned. Now, unfortunately for me, I have to detune the TV slightly. To bringing the sound. Now this means, at least to me it means, that the sound IF it needs an alignment. It's not properly aligned. Uh, the output of the amplifier is, is just fine. I mean, if you look at the signal, it's really clear 
and not distorted and by me uh, and I mean by not distorted that it's not clipping either side of the signal this whole schematic here is how the this is how the amplifier in the Sanyo looks like so you see here an NPM transistor that serves as a pre-amplifier and a driver to drive the two output transistors you see here which is an NPN, this one and a PNP which is this one alright now I made a few changes to this whole amplifier because the silicon the I mean the germanium transistors which were used for this one and this one and this one were well these two were broken and this one was a bit weak okay so I replaced them by silicon transistors uh, to be more precise this one and this one I replaced by a BC547 and this one I replaced by a BC557 now because silicon transistors use uh, or are a slightly different technology they also necessitate a bit higher biasing and by higher biasing I mean that the potential for the base which is this here yeah needs to be higher than for a germanium transistor so this transistor and of course these two need to be biased a bit harder you could say so with a little bit more voltage to be driven so what I did to um, test out what the biasing should be now I, I could have gone the hard way and calculate everything but what I instead did was I replaced this resistor here and this resistor here okay so the 680 ohms and the 3900 ohms by uh, potentiometers well small pots really and uh, I replaced this resistor here by a fixed resistor of 20 ohms all right and by doing that I could as as it were tune in the right amount of biasing for this one and for these two so that they would uh, output enough power to drive the speaker normally let's say an NPN transistor would be connected like this and the base of the transistor is biased via a voltage divider bridge like this pretty much like this and according to the resistances used for R1 and R2 you can make the base uh, slightly more positive or slightly uh, slightly more positive in regard to ground or slightly more negative in in, uh, in comparison to the positive uh, voltage supply right now remember a transistor whether that is an NPN or a PNP has three different conduction modes either a transistor is off and then there is no current flowing from collector to emitter or the transistor is fully on and then all the available current runs from uh, collector to emitter so in effect it's like a closed switch at that uh, at that point uh, or it can be somewhere in the in a specific conductivity mode yeah so it's not in saturation 
Right, so here you have something which explains in graphical form what I'm talking about. So below this point here, if the base voltage is too close to ground potential, so zero, the transistor is off. As soon as you reach a certain voltage, I mean bias voltage, which if I'm not mistaken is somewhere around 600 millivolts uh, between base and emitter, it starts to conduct. Now if the voltage is too high then no matter how much more voltage you would put on the base it will stay on and that's what they call um, saturation. Yeah? In this case the transistor will be on, fully on and will stay on no matter how voltage how much voltage is on its base and it will also conduct maximum uh, current. Now what we need is a transistor which is somewhere which is biased so that its conductivity is lying on this slope here. And ideally it should be on somewhere in the center of the slope. So now if you send in a small AC signal to its base then the transistor will amplify that or well, I should say small current really then the transistor will amplify that current to a current which is a lot bigger yeah, at its output and it will output it completely. Um, in other words um, it will output a signal which is uh, pretty much as big as the I mean peak to peak as large as the uh, power supply allows for. Now and here comes a little problem if you bias the transistor so if the potential of the base of the transistor yeah, is um, either is incorrect so it's either too positive or too negative you will get something like this um, when you input a, a small signal and the base is too positive then the positive end of the, the voltage will be clipped so the top of the positive side of an AC signal will be cut off. So you get this, a flat end and then the full negative side. Yeah? The same thing happens if your base is uh, a bias too low. And then if you input a signal you will get the full positive side of the AC signal but the negative side will be clipped, so cut off. All right, and that will result in a sound which sounds scratchy. Uh, well, not nice. The sound will, in fact, will sound really horrible. As I told you, I replaced the transistors which you see here. I re they were originally germanium transistors. Now I replaced them by uh, an NPN type um, silicium or silicon transistor which uh, in the case of the NPN is a BC547. Now the thing is first of all the germanium uh, uh, transistor requires far less voltage to uh, bias its base and far less current in fact to um, bias its base than a silicon transistor and but its amplification factor so the factor by which it amplifies a small input current to an output current is only 50 
Whereas for the BC547, it can amplify an input current by almost 300. So you can understand easily that the biasing of those transistors you see here yeah, will have to be completely different from germanium transistors. All right? So that's what I did. I found out, experimentally of course, I found out what sort of resistor I would need here and what sort of a resistor I would need here to bias the transistors correctly. And I did so. And um, in fact the biasing needs to be in such a way that when you input a, a signal into your push-pull setup, which is this, this is what they call a push-pull amplifier, all right? Um, it needs to be biased in such a way that uh, for every positive end of your AC signal, this transistor outputs one half of the signal and for this part of the signal, so the negative part of the signal, this transistor outputs a signal which is negative. So if you combine these two, you get in fact an output signal which looks like this. Only much, much, uh, much, much stronger, of course, much more powerful. And that's what we need to try to achieve. So we need to bias the base of this one and the base of this one in such a way that when one transistor stops conducting right here, this transistor starts to conduct right here. Okay. So this one goes up to here, stops conducting, and this transistor here comes up to here, so doesn't conduct, and then suddenly starts to conduct. So, and the point at which one stops conducting and one starts conducting, so that point here is what they call the crossover point. So, what I tried to do experimentally with, uh, with these parts here is I tried to um, uh, find the correct values to bias the transistor. So, I used this little potentiometer here to bias the driver transistor and I used this one here to bias the two power transistors so one here and one over there so this one here and that's exactly what I did well there you are I uh, finished building in all the parts that repair the sound amplifier of the Sanyo and what you're seeing right now is uh, the convergence test so you all also have the checkers test image I mean yeah, then you have the grayscale that's the coarse grayscale that's the fine grayscale and all in all the image is really not that bad um, there is one weird thing though and that is that that line you see crossing the screen it's it's very light it's almost ghostly light but it is there um, however its brightness diminishes with each uh, band of grayscale so in fact in the black it's it's off so yeah I'm 
guessing this may be a problem of the vertical deflection. Maybe an artifact created by a bad capacitor, possibly. I don't know, we'll have to investigate. Okay, so what else can I show you? Oh yeah, the crosshairs. Okay. Like I said, it looks... The image looks very decent. Maybe the focus is off by a bit, but but it's really not that bad. Uh, okay, what else? Uh, this is a plain color field. Uh, this is a coarse, a very coarse uh, grayscale. Uh, this is a, a test image, a bit like my test image up there. Okay, but simpler, let's say. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, I don't know what this is. Let me see. Okay. Raster, it says. Hmm. Okay. Then this is the multi-burst. Alright. And the multi-burst, if you look closely. So, the space between the, the lines shows you at which frequency the burst, the image burst, is being sent. So this is very low frequency, a bit higher, still a bit higher, still higher, and so forth, okay? And the higher the frequency, it can uh, resolve on the screen. So the, the better the quality of the image, obviously. And if I look closely, I can detect lines up to here. They're faint, but they're there. Uh, let me see, maybe with the contrast a little. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see them. They're, they're there, but they're very faint. So the resolution of the signal detection, yeah, and ultimately showing it on the screen, is quite good for such a, a simple, cheap little TV, in fact. So yeah, not bad. Uh, so the video will probably only necessitate a, a slight adjustment, if at all. However, the sound is very much off. So if I detune the TV a little bit, I switch on the sound, there, you see? I get the test tone, but then I detune the TV, not too badly, but still, it's not in sync with with the image, see? This is how the image should look like, all right? And this is how it looks when it sounds. Yeah, not too good. All right, so yes, I removed all the, the test components from the board and uh, I placed all the good components on the other side, okay? The only thing I need to mount still is the heatsink for the transistors. Right, so for those who are curious which values I used in the end, well, these are the values uh, to replace the old resistors. Okay, and in fact the middle one, which is a 15.27 kilo ohms, is in fact a 16K plus a 352K in parallel. And that gave me a value, let's say like 15.33 kilo ohms, which is fairly close to the value that I really needed, namely the 15.27. And the way I uh, know that is because I unsoldered my test pot 
and measured their value, okay? And that way I knew what sort of values I would need for my resistors. Okay? So, uh, oh, by, by the way, these resistance values are very much dependent on the transistor you use. So, even if you use exactly the same transistors I used, namely a, a BC547 and a BC557, uh, these values might still be uh, not the right values to use, okay? So, these values are for reference purposes only. So, here are all the knobs. Um, I cleaned them for 45 minutes in all in my ultrasonic cleaner. And, um, yeah, they came out reasonably clean. Uh, at least the silver knobs which are the on off volume which is let me see this one okay that came out all right okay so and then the other two which are brightness and contrast those came out all right too now the escutcheon of course was dirty but and and the silver that was on top of the raised text and edge is a bit, well, worse for wear, but I can restore that, no problem. The escutcheon itself is reasonably clean. So remember, it went in here. I suspect they made something like this to cover the hole up because perhaps in a in another model, there was probably a second tuner knob right here. But it isn't there, so they put an escutcheon in, in the place. Now, uh, the tuning button of the tuner cleaned up okay. Uh, it is transparent plastic, but as you can tell, it has yellowed over the years. And I tried to bleach it, literally, with um, chlorine, and, uh, well, it did bleach a little bit, but not to such a degree that it's uh, clear white plastic, or, well, clear translucent plastic anymore. So, right here, you can tell, it's, it's pretty yellowish. It's unfortunate, but that's the way how plastic ages. Um, now, there was a, 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 an aluminum ring around the tuning knob, and the glue let loose in the ultrasonic cleaner. So, I'll have to find a way to reattach it around the tuning knob. And the same with the, the little escutcheon which was on top of the tuning knob. That too let loose. So here's the glue, you see. And well, the glue just, well, was old, crusty. So yeah. Well, that's it for the knobs. Let's get on with something else. Alright, so I discharged the tube by uh, sliding an, uh, a long screwdriver, something like this in fact, okay, underneath the high voltage cap and I attached the stem of the screwdriver to the chassis with a crocodile lead. So uh, I'm pretty certain there's no more high voltage. Now, the high voltage knob as it were is attached with a little clamp to the picture tube so what I'm going to try is to carefully without damaging the tube uh, slide my needle nose pliers underneath and clamp together that little
that little clamp without damaging the tube, hopefully. Because if we damage the tube, we always run, run the risk of it imploding, you know? And that would be really, really risky and dangerous. Okay, so here it is, the high voltage cap. And you can see why I had some trouble releasing the anode. It's really two little clips, okay, you see here, that are hooked inside a little hole inside the tube. I'll show you where. Okay, let me show you. Uh, it's over there. But right there where I'm shining. Alright, so there's a, a little opening there. And right into that opening fits uh, those two little clips fit. Alright, but you have to be careful when you release those, because if you're not, you risk having an, a CRT uh, implode on you. Well, actually it will ultimately provoke an explosion, and that might be really painful, uh, if not outright dangerous. Okay, so... <coughs> Here is the high voltage board in, uh, in its entirety. So I pulled loose the connector and here it is. So there's the high voltage rectifier and transformer up here. And then there are several power transistors which generate uh, the high voltage. Uh, there are a few smaller transistors as well. There's one here, for example. And there are a couple here. And then there are also quite a few capacitors that will probably need replacing. Um, a few electrolytics for sure so this one is the most obvious one but okay there's a, a small transistor here there are a few electrolytics here all right so there's one over there so yeah um, there are also a few non-electrolytic capacitors like the, this one for example which is an 0.1 microfarad or 100 nanofarad. This one is 15 nanofarad. And they are rated for 400 volts. Alright. Okay, so yes, I think I have my work cut out for, for me. So, what I'm going to do next is replace uh, all the electrolytics and uh, measure a few resistors and a few capacitors to see whether they have drifted in value. For some of you who are still not convinced that replacing capacitors, well electrolytic capacitors, is a necessity, let me show you why I systematically always replace electrolytics. So this is a 16 volt, 470 microfarad, all right? Okay, have a look at what the screen says. So it says 537 microfarad, okay, it, it drops and it rises a little bit, but it's all over the place, you know. And in fact, I'll show you why it's all over the place. Oh, and by the way, just for reference, this is a brand new 470 microfarad. And it, this is 15 volts, okay? So let me show you what this one measures. Oh, and by the way, 
that's a, a simple little uh, to know trick. The short lead is always the cathode or negative, and the long lead is always the positive. Alright, so that's a nice thing to remember. Okay, it, it probably needs to charge a little. Oh, it's charging up. Okay, so this is a a brand new 470 microfarad capacitor and as you can tell it's rising slowly in value but I'm pretty certain it will stop at uh, 470 microfarad alright now one of the reasons um, that I replace electrolytics is not only because they drift in value but also because they leak and if you look at the board where I uh, released the capacitor okay, do you see that that glob of oily stuff wait let me show you so that glob right here okay well that's where the electrolytic leaked and you can see that at the positive end of the uh, of the capacitor you see that brownish stuff around the positive lead at the top well that's where the capacitor leaked so you see it's all shiny and you can even see the, the capacitor is slightly bulging at the negative end. So yeah, this capacitor was slowly turning bad. So that's one of the reasons why I always replace electrolytics. I finished replacing all the electrolytics. Uh, on the board and in fact you can see it's those uh, black ones with the shiny cap okay, and there are quite a few in there there's one there and there are a few here four in fact uh, and there are, is one two yeah two here so yeah let's say six electrolytics and there was one tantalum although tantalums are reputed to be quite stable reliable capacitors on the temperature um, I had to replace the one which was in here and I replaced it with a new tantalum capacitor which is this little yellow one here now I'm running over these large gray capacitors you see here and uh, I also measured the large green one now the large green one should be 2.2 uh, microfarad and it measured 2.7 so not too good in fact but let's say well it's it's tolerable it's it's not exagger exaggeratingly bad so I decided that I would leave the green one in so here's a little mystery for you have a look at the picture tube and more precisely the date marker on the picture tube see here it says August 1970 now I happen to, to believe that this TV or rather the model that we're seeing was built around 1965 but apparently the tube is from August 1970 so it's possible the TV is actually five years younger than I thought it would be um, interesting or unless of course the tube that we're looking at the 140 TB4 
is in fact a replacement tube. It's possible, but I'm guessing the tube we're looking at right now is factory. So the other possibility is that this TV was actually assembled uh, not in, uh, in 1965, but in August 1970 or thereabouts. Well, I replaced quite a few of the electrolytics, so it's possible that I might have to reset the the settings of the TV a bit. Okay, so adjust, in fact, the settings. Uh, I'm hoping, of course, uh, that I won't have to do it because the TV worked reasonably well uh, as it was uh, but I do hope replacing the capacitors uh, will have fixed that that one stripe we saw running in the middle of the screen remember so I'm hoping that at least that little problem will be fixed so um, give me a moment to hook it all back up and then we'll have a look at how the TV performs. Alright, so I set my uh, lap supply to 15.1 volts as the service manual prescribes. I hooked up my uh, pattern generator and I set it to uh, channel 8 and by the way it's uh, Paul, okay it's a Paul uh, B signal, right? Okay. Um, and I, I, of course, hooked up my uh, the Sanyo to my uh, lab uh, supply. So, um, oh yeah, and I placed everything on a wooden board, okay, just to make sure that there would be no high voltage leaking to anything uh, else but the TV, okay? In fact, uh, you could argue uh, the high voltage part, which is right here, is still a little bit too close to the underlying machine here. Uh, but I'm guessing that um, it is far enough from the chassis of my function or my pattern generator. So I don't think there will be any arcing towards, um, well, towards the chassis of my uh, pattern generator. Okay, so yes, um, in fact I'm going to Voila, I'm going to slide it up more like this. Okay, so the main chassis of the TV is resting on a piece of foam on top of the wooden board. Not so much to insulate it, but to keep the chassis uh, as far away from high voltage as possible. Okay, so the foam is in fact acting as uh, an insulator between the chassis of the TV and the main board. Okay, well, um, I would say let's switch it on and let's have a look what the TV will do. Okay, switched it on. The current is rising. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh uh, yeah, and like I expected, um, yeah, as I expected, changing the capacitor, uh, capacitors um, has in fact changed uh, the image somewhat, the shape of the image. So yeah, we'll have to um, 
Mm. We'll have to uh, um, change those settings a little bit. But let's see, I'm curious to see whether that stripe is gone in the center. Oh yeah, it is gone. There's no more uh, line in the center of the screen as there was before. Nice. So replacing the electrolytics has in fact fixed that strange line that was showing up in the center of the screen. Alright. Alright, so this is as I've gotten it and it's pretty darn sharp and very symmetrical. So I could get the image rather symmetrical but I just couldn't shift it all downwards very much. So well I already replaced all the electrolytics so I started to look at the next possible culprits. I did end up finding, let's say, well, not exactly a smoking gun, but certainly something that was a bit wrong in the deflection board, or I, I should say on the deflection board, of the Sanyo. And it turned out to be these two capacitors here. Alright? So, well, actually, these are the new ones, okay? So, what happened to cause me a little bit of trouble in the end were, let me show you on the schematic, were these two capacitors here, all right? And these are very close to the potential meter with which you set the focus which is actually, you could say, the sharpness of the electron beam which projects an image on the screen and it's that little potentiometer here, okay, R809. Now, uh, the thing that was a bit weird, you could say, was that when I took out the original capacitors, they measured out fine. Uh, but it seems that even though their value checks out, uh, they were leaky. And in fact, uh, this one here was the leakiest of the two. And that's, let me show you. So that's the capacitor 319. Okay. Or I, sh I should say. 6, 6, oh, sorry, 6, 16, okay? So, let's have a look here. So, capacitor 6, 16 is this capacitor right here turned out to be leaky. And, of course, you can see that uh, a lot of the high voltage was uh, bled down to the chassis of the TV. So when I say it comes from the high voltage, I mean it really comes from very high voltage, uh, right here. In fact, on the high voltage transformer, which produces ultimately, right here at the top, a few thousands of volts, which will be rectified, and used to uh, power the anode on the CRT, you know, that, that red wire leading all the way up to the body of the CRT, okay? In any case, uh, the voltage around here, when I say the high voltage, okay, then you can see that on the high voltage transformer there is an output here which is rectified and uh, produces about 300 volts okay 
So part of the focusing uh, potential was bled down to the chassis, which of course influenced not only the sharpness of the image, but perhaps surprisingly also the size of the image. So you'll remember that I, I told you a, a few minutes ago that the screen uh, the screen seems to be too high in fact or not placed correctly uh, on, on, on the CRT's uh, picture face okay and that was also because of a, a wrong focusing voltage okay so intermittently this capacitor was bleeding electricity to uh, to ground so I fixed that and uh, to make sure that I would not get any more trouble from this side here anyway I also replaced the C615 which is uh, the new yellow capacitor you see over there okay so now the image is not only stable and sharp but it also has the correct positioning uh, on the CRT screen so great um, okay so it turned out not to be a resistor which was defective but uh, at least one capacitor uh, which I replaced by this new one here uh, okay what next well um, I'm going to remount the deflection board which you see here back up into the chassis and I'm going to unmount the high frequency board which is uh, here uh, in fact on the left side of the TV if you look at it from the front and uh, well that's the, the tuner and all the high frequency stuff that goes on into the TV well actually no the tuner is that little box here okay where the tuning knob is but the tuner sends uh, signals down to the high frequency board down there and that as it were decodes radio frequency signals into an image here is a look on the high frequency board of the Sanyo and as you can tell there are quite a few electrolytics on it so I've got my work cut out for me um, but this uh, episode has been going on too long already so I'm going to keep uh, uh, changing the capacitors and uh, checking the high frequency board and oh by the way also um, well repairing let's say the case of the TV for the next episode so I hope you liked this episode as far as it goes uh, please leave your comments down below the video Give me a thumbs up if you liked the video, subscribe if you haven't already and um, I hope I'll see you all back for the third and probably the last episode on restoring the Sanyo 5TC1 Katnika TV. So thanks for watching.